Welcome everybody to the second webinar in our 2021 Foresighting Forum. As those of you who attended webinar one will remember, this year our forum is wholly online as a result of the pandemic that we're all living through. Many of you will be joining us from places that are in lockdown today and we are really thankful for your participation at such a difficult time. My name is Dan Silkstone and I'm from Energy Consumers Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, whose lands I am coming from today. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and reiterate that all of us, wherever we are in Australia, are on Aboriginal land. As we said last webinar, this year's forum is about leaning into the cataclysmic events that have marked our recent past and asking what we can learn from them to prepare us for the future. This webinar will discuss how together we can make the energy system and the communities it serves more resilient in the face of future disaster events. Anyone who has read the latest IPCC report or just seen the daily headlines this week would know that such disasters are going to be more common and more intense in our future. It's vital that we take urgent steps to mitigate the impact of climate change, but it's also really important that we prepare for what's coming. And that means building resilience. This week, we launched a longitudinal study of people and communities in parts of East Gippsland that were impacted by severe bushfires in late 2019 and early 2020. That report will be a provocation and inspiration and something of a guide for some of our discussions today. And we sincerely thank those who generously agreed to share their experiences with us. And you'll be hearing from the report's author soon. One thing I did want to mention quickly, we're not just glad that you've all joined us today. We're grateful for who has joined us. In the audience today, we have representatives from many networks and retailers, from academia, research institutions, market bodies, advocacy groups and government, not to mention everyday energy consumers. We have people from the broader disaster response community and from other utilities beyond energy. This is the perfect group of people to begin having this conversation today and to make sure that it continues when we all log off 90 minutes from now. And that's really exciting. Quick bit of housekeeping before we get started. I need to remind you that the best way to experience this webinar is via the Zoom app. If you haven't already, we encourage you to download the Zoom client and you'll find a link in the reminder email that you would have received from us about an hour ago. If you experience any issues with being able to see the discussion in the Q&A thread, this will likely be the cause. So sing out if you're having problems and our team is here to help. We encourage you to use both the chat and the Q&A functions that you'll find at the bottom of your screen today. However, we will be taking questions later from the Q&A thread. So please put your questions there. Any com comments or other um, issues you want to raise can go in the chat thread. We'll start today with a short presentation from Nicola Heppenstall, who's the Executive Director of the Insight Centre. Nicola is an experienced social researcher who was commissioned by Energy Consumers Australia to spend 12 months talking with East Gippsland residents about their energy experiences before, during and after the serious fire event that tore through communities like Malakuta and Buchan. Her report, which is called The Connections That Matter, contains powerful insights about these people's experiences and identifies themes that suggest how we can all help to build better prepared and more resilient systems and communities. Following Nicola, we'll hear from Tom Hallam, who's General Manager of Regulation at Osnet Services. Osnet is the network operator in the parts of Victoria that are dealt with by Nicola's research. And we are thankful for their openness and joining us for this conversation today. Tom and his colleague, Stephanie Judd, will give us a network perspective on what is being learned from these events and how these events are requiring networks to think and act differently. And our final speaker will be Luke Jenner, who's General Manager of Customer and Network Services at Essential Energy. Luke will share some of Essential's experiences and learnings from recent fire and flood events in New South Wales. The discussion we want today is one that moves far beyond the boundaries of East Gippsland, from those people's specific experiences to lessons and themes that are relevant to people all over Australia. Following Luke, our CEO, Lynn Gallagher, will join in to kick off our discussion with a couple of observations and questions for the panellists. And then we'll progress to the most important part of today's event, your questions and thoughts and the discussion we hope that they will prompt. To start with, we have a framing question for you to consider as you listen to our speakers today, just to get your brains warmed up. 
question is, what role can your organisation play in bridging the gaps to meet community expectations before, during and after a crisis event? We'd like you to reflect on this as we go. Maybe even to answer the question, we'll pose a related one in the Q&A thread that can be accessed with the button at the bottom of your screen. After today's event, we'll synthesise all of the questions, comments and discussion and feed them back to you as a record of what was said today. We'll also be live tweeting this event today, if that's your thing. You can join in if you want using the hashtag TakeCharge21. You'll see links to all of our social accounts on the screen and we encourage you to connect with us if you're interested in finding out more about Energy Consumers Australia or in continuing this conversation after today. And now, uh, after too much rambling from me, I'd like to welcome Nicola Heppenstall from the Insight Centre. Thanks, Dan. Um, this report that I'll be taking you through, through some of the highlights of was really the culmination of 18 months of talking to people who had experienced the uh, traumatic bushfires across East Gippsland. And look, when we sat down with Lynn and the ECA team about where and how to undertake the research, we wanted to focus in on an area that had a significant impact and really track people's experience across those the, the recovery period um, before, during and after the fires. And it's, East Gippsland sounds like a good place to start. I'll show you in a little while the sort of extent of the impact on that area. Um, but uh, it was really quite significant. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, I'd also like to acknowledge that these devastating fires actually were on the lands of the Gunakunai, the Bidwell and the Monaro people. And we pay our respects to the thousands of years of their ongoing custodianship of the land. And of course, you know, the brave people that actually shared their experiences of the, the bushfire recovery process for them so far, and the sort of role that they played in wanting to make sure that the learnings from their experience could be taken forward so that we can respond to these sorts of crisis events better. We have a look at the um, map on the left. This just shows the sort of extent of the areas impacted across the East Gippsland area. And one of the things that was pr pretty unique about this experience was the length of time that the emergency was in place. So the fires started in East Gippsland on the 21st of November in 2019, following a series of lightning strikes. And by the time they were declared contained in late February, they'd burnt almost through more than 1.3 million hectares. Four people had perished. Hundreds of homes had been lost and livestock, agriculture, and businesses and livelihoods devastated. So not to underestimate the significant challenge for restoring energy supply. In total, some 1,000 kilometres of power lines were affected with 7,000 customers off supply because of the damage. And remember, the fires continued to cause damage to these assets and indirect damage from burning trees falling across power lines during that many months of the crisis. Osnet did not have access to some of those affected network areas to restore power until months after the initial damage due to ongoing fire activity. And of course, during the period that we were speaking to people, we also had COVID, which impacted many of the face-to-face -face service deliveries and ability to recover during the, the period we spoke to them. On the right-hand side, you can see some orange dots on the map. And these are where our participants came from. So we went broad and spoke to people across both large towns like Malakuta, but also small communities like Buchan and, um, you know, um, Brotheran, where we actually were able to speak to, um, you know, people that had quite different experiences of the recovery period. Next slide. When we actually started to think about what it would be like to talk to people who'd experienced such trauma and talk to them about energy, we were so slightly trepidatious. How are we going to bring the conversation around to what was the role of energy in the network in their lives? We often say in the water sector, I'm a non-executive director of a government board, that water equals life. But what we found was that energy equals living. 
for many of the people we spoke to, the loss and restoration of energy supply was often, from their perspective, the things that bookmarked both the crisis event and the start of their recovery, underlying the critical role that energy plays in our lives and businesses. Go to the next slide. We can see that our reliance on technology and energy during the crisis was certainly challenged. Many people were unable to access the critical emergency service information as the mobile phone network went down very early in the crisis. The energy network went down well before the high fires hit many communities. So their mobile battery supply was a significant issue for those people who could still access the mobile coverage. In that moment, people spoke about relying on their local network, the CFA captain and watching his family. And when they were going to evacuate, everyone was going to leave. They sought neighbors who still had a secure energy supply for information about what was happening. And while the radio obviously plays an important role, not everybody had considered that they might actually need an alternate source of information in the heat of a crisis. Once the fire had passed, the hum of the generators as to re-establish power supply in some of those critical communities actually gave them a sense of normality. As for many people, it took weeks and weeks for the energy system to be repaired and in many instances, a total build was required. So you can really imagine the way in which they felt quite insecure about their lives and their energy supply. If we have a look at the next slide, we can see that the crisis experience heightened people's desire for, for self-sufficiency, for an alternative when things go wrong. And you can see by some of these uh, comments that people made in our conversations with them, the sense of vulnerability, the anxiety that this had created and what they wanted to do next time. What did they learn? You know, they needed to be better prepared. They needed to have a good generator and that the power will go out in a crisis and you can't rely on anyone but you. I think it's really important to think of this heightened sense of vulnerability and therefore fueling so much of the conversation we had about how can we be more self-sufficient? What are alternatives that can leave, leave us with some control in these sorts of circumstances? On the next slide, we have a, a lovely picture. And this is of Malakuta, uh, taken from Malakuta. And the, the masks are actually um, wishes from all of the first responders and people that entered the community very, very early on in the crisis to help with their recovery. And I'm going to talk about community resilience and recovery um, because in some ways it's very different to individual recovery. On the next slide, we can see that the sorts of things that actually gave communities a sense of resilience was that they were able to pull together. So those communities where people were able to um, reach out and go above and beyond were instances that gave people hope. So there were, you know, people spoke to us about the things that, you know, in that moment of crisis really gave them a sense that people were on their side and that things would be okay. And sometimes these were little things. It was like the Australian Defence Force, you know, in a moment where they were waiting for something to happen and had a spare moment saying, well, would you like us to clean the windows on the school so that when the children come back, you know, it's all bright. The food bank food, people spoke to us about it being of higher quality than the food that they could get in their community on a, on a regular basis. And so it left them with the sense that people really cared. The Sikhs providing meals for all of the people who were in need. And look, we heard amazing stories. You know, people that got bulldozers out to remove the rotting food that lined streets as people emptied their fridges and freezers as, um, you know, they were trying to clean up after the, the sort of impact of the fire. Uh, the people that opened their homes to others. Um, who became the mobile phone charging area because they had an off-grid energy solution. Um, and the ex it, what was really critical was that organisations reached out, you know, rather than relying on them to get in touch. 
And it was something that was really particularly important in that immediate aftermath where people felt so fragile and, you know, weren't really able to wait on hold for the next available operator um, and are needing con to conserve their mobile battery. You know, they were making decisions about do I, who do I call? Do I call my family and tell them what's going on or do I actually reach out to an organisation that might be able to help me establish, um, you know, some critical infrastructure? But I think it's really clear from the quotes on the following slide that not all communities can recover easily from a crisis. Um, in following a crisis, communities are really fractured, they're traumatised, and in many instances, they're collections of people who don't necessarily agree on a way forward. The sheer number of matters that they have to address, the decisions that they need to make can be overwhelming, and particularly for those smaller communities where the lack of existing services are highlighted in the post-crisis period. You can see Julie here talking about, you know, the fact that they just don't have services. There's no doctor, there's no physiotherapist. It really adds to the sense, at least for her, that it might be time to move on. The sadness and concern that the community have about where they live and what it will become um, is very clear from the quote on this side. Um, we, we also found that the COVID experience really fractured some communities. And you can see Michelle talking about the recovery process being so long, um, no capacity to relax. And actually, you know, the, the kind of way in which they'd come together and felt that they could recover was now disconnected as they were all, you know, back in lockdown and people weren't coming to their communities. So that sense of isolation, and we must remember that many of these communities live in quite isolated um, areas, but in a crisis, it's really brought to the fore. So what can we say about energy response and community engagement? On the next slide, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the fires had a significant impact on the East Gippsland area. The COVID lockdowns, waylaid recovery plans, and Early in the COVID crisis, there were actually a number of close, cl close calls where people travelled from um, Melbourne and actually um, had COVID. So there was an increased sense of isolation amongst communities and that they were on their own. Now, it's really clear that there were lots of things we did right. And um, in the report, we go through what are some of those shining examples of things that went really well for people. But what I thought I'd do today is focus on some things that we could learn from in terms of what might we might do better next time. And I really want to be clear that's not to discredit the work undertaken by Osnet and other service providers to resource critical services um, and a sense of normality as soon as possible. Um, you might remember earlier I mentioned the significant role of restoring electricity and that it what it had on people's well-being and recovery and a sense that life's progressing. But if we look at the following slide and read some of those quotes, um, what we found was that people on reflection felt that a sense, um, a sense of um, sadness that the rebuild had not delivered a more secure energy supply. So these communities have often um, experienced quite um, high levels of outage. They talk about Malakuta as being at the end of the line where any um, you know, impact on the, I think it's a couple of hundred kilometres of wires and poles can mean that there's an energy outage there. But you know, it was only when the supply had been connected and then they started to see, oh, we still have outages. Um, you know, they lost confidence that they can rely on power because of their sense that actually this is so critical and how are they going to be able to um, ensure that they themselves have the things in place that they can um, do to secure their power. For many people, that was actually getting a generator. On the following slide, um, it was really clear that in the context of the sort of total rebuild, that there was the desire to consider how to better service their needs. And as I said, this is about, in many instances, providing a more robust and reliable energy supply. But I think it's important to also reflect that when people were thinking about what build back better means, they were also thinking about you know, how new technologies would address some of our um, impacts in terms of climate change. Um, so while for them, it was really about supply security, they also just assumed that new technologies would deliver a better carbon um, footprint for us all. If we have a look at the next slide, um, these uh, quotes come from people that actually lived in Malakuta. 
And in Mallacoota, um, the Electoral Commission oversaw candidates and voting to establish a committee to manage the community's recovery. Now, I think this is a really interesting concept because you remember earlier I said so many people are fractured, communities are fractured, people are feeling very distressed. And with all the things they need to make decisions on, um, this gave them a sense of control and a sense of their own destiny. So one of the things that um, has culminated in the sort of longer term um, liaison between Mallacoota and Osnet was the development of a battery system uh, designed to deliver a more secure energy supply. So you can see how people spoke about feeling that they've got control over their rebuild. It's given them a structure so it's clear how you get your views across to someone and everyone can have a voice. But also that, you know, we're going to have some sense that they can restore power sooner for our town when things go down along that 100 kilometres or so of um, the, the line that goes to Mallacoota. So I think the other thing is when we were talking to people, we did speak to them, those people that lived outside Mallacoota, about just what they thought about that kind of system for their community. And I guess there's a sense that, you know, this type of um, self-determination and taking control of your own destiny does not work for all communities. Um, you know, we re need to really recognise that not all want to or are able to take on this kind of um, a sort of self-determination. In terms of community engagement, as you can see from the, the next slide, it really is a long-term dialogue. And so when we spoke to people about it, you know, it was like, oh, I like the idea of a standalone system, um, but gosh, I've got lots of questions. When would it kick in? How long would it last? What interruptions to my services would occur? Will everything operate the same? What do I need to prepare? I mean, Kelly had some questions, but they really reflected the sorts of, um, you know, questions that people we spoke to had about just what this type of system would mean for them. Now, I've been working in communications and marketing for really longer than I care to reveal. And it's an old saying that, um, and I think it's been attributed to George Bernard Shaw, but it still rings true in our digital world. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And what we found in Mallacoota was a lot of concern when they did have an outage and they wondered what this thing was that had been built and what was it meant to do. Um, so when you've said it once and you've said it again and you're so sick of saying it, you're still a long way from reaching everyone. And what we found was that there are a lot of myths and misconceptions that filled that void. So I, I think it's a really great thing to consider how we can actually continue that dialogue with consumers about just what's happening and what impact it's going to have on their lives. And look, on a final note, before I hand to our, our next panellist, um, what was clear from all of our um, conversations was that, and I mentioned it earlier about the assumption that these new technologies would be part of um, building back better and that they'd also address climate change. And I think as Dan mentioned, um, you know, the, the startling and worrying findings of the IPCC report um, really actually, I guess, give for me a, a sort of that rallying cry from think global and act local seems never more apt. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nicola. Um, Osnet Services uh, is no stranger to natural disasters, unfortunately. Um, we, we cover the uh, distribution network in the east of Victoria and cover a lot of um, very heavily vegetated and mountainous um, country. And we're, of course, at the forefront of networks being affected by climate change over time, um, with most of the adverse trends um, that are arising from the IPCC report um, affecting eastern Victoria um, in particular quite harshly. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, now, networks are becoming more resilient to normal bad weather events and underlying reliability has improved over the last two decades quite substantially. But today we're talking about disaster scale events that overwhelm the standard response. Um, but even here, uh, networks have been delivering some incremental improvements. Um, if we could move to the next slide. So better forecasts um, are allowing better preparation and that is allowing a, a huge improvement in, in how we anticipate and, and react 
to some of these natural disasters. Um, this can include the pre-placement of resources where they will need it, be needed beforehand and the pre-placement of mobile generation. Um, and the effectiveness of that was demonstrated during the 2020 um, bushfires when um, four communities, four important refuge communities um, were kept on supply continually throughout the bushfire emergency, um, despite their network connections being destroyed. And this came about from us anticipating from, from the Bureau of Meteorology's um, and Emergency Services forecast of those fires, um, anticipating where that generation needed to be located. Um, and we all saw the, uh, you know, the pictures of Malakuta, um, Malakuta residents having to be evacuated by the Navy and so forth. But interestingly, over the more than 30 days that Malakuta had no network supply, we actually kept it on continually um, with the pre-placed generator um, at that point. And of course, um, that involved um, maintenance um, from our staff and obviously constant re resupply of, of, the, of the diesel to power the generator as well. And of course, we relied heavily on the emergency services um, to be able to do that. Um, and in the recent storms Osnets uh, had um, in the Dandenong Ranges, um, again, we were able to pre-place response resources. Um, a good example is we anticipated which rivers would be subject to flooding and made sure that crews were placed on both sides of that river before the storm hit, and that allowed us um, to respond on both sides of a flooded river, even though all roads were cut. So very, very um, important improvements there. Um, we might move on to the next slide. Um, so lots of learnings and improvements during the events as well. Um, one of the most important um, things we did for the first time with the bushfires is have face-to-face -face support at relief centres. Um, and this is crucial because as we're well aware, modern communication systems go down um, after an extended period without power. And um, one of the things that causes the most anxiety in these communities is not knowing what's going on. So the ability for someone to come down to the local um, relief centre, be able to talk to someone from our company and understand when crews might be able to access uh, and fix um, their supply is absolutely vital when they don't have a phone, um, they can't get um, any media communication um, through to them. And again, we, we did that in limited circumstances during the bushfire, but we learned from that experience being so successful. So in the storms that we recently had, we rolled out um, a presence at over 20 relief centres um, over 20 relief centres and again we had great feedback um, from customers just being able to access information when they didn't have access to media or, or, or phone um, technology. Um, we also rebuild with superior, um, with superior assets where that's cost effective. So for example across all the assets um, on poles that were destroyed during the fire we built back with um, concrete poles rather than wooden poles and that, of course, makes it a much more resilient system um, when we do that. Um, we also clear easements much more aggressively after a natural disaster. Um, we're targeting all the, the trees that have been weakened or damaged or even killed um, in a storm or fire that's hit. Um, and that improves reliability um, across the long run. Um, but fundamental long-term change is not possible in the heat of battle, and I think we just heard from Nicola, a lot of the feedback um, from our customer base, why didn't you put in SAPs or put in alternative technology? When we have to get things back on quickly, we simply can't, we simply can't do that. So wide scale undergrounding, for example, is often advanced as a possibility, but it's incredibly cost prohibitive um, and for serving small remote communities, doubly so. If we might skip to the next, um, slide. Uh, so Osnet believes new technology offers the pathway um, to greater resilience for our communities. Uh, and after over the last two years, we've been developing a clear vision and a set of design principles on how to achieve this. Um, if we flip to the next slide. 
the vision is structured in, in two parts or phases. Um, firstly, you have to lay the infrastructure foundation and the local capabilities to enable the transition. And that's through deploying a combination of micro grid, grid technology, um, standalone energy systems, uh, solar generation, um, battery storage is, is absolutely vital for isolate, um, for islanding capability. And longer term, as you're getting transition in the transport sector as well, um, building in electric vehicle charging and potentially hydrogen charging, um, hydrogen vehicle charging as well into the local communities. Um, secondly, this can be partnered with existing incentives to invest in local generation um, and investing in a circular economy and, and allowing a community to accelerate towards 100% local generation. Um, and, and this involves obviously looking at alternative generation and storage options. Um, a good example of Malacuta is that there's possibilities with the water treatment plant, um, um, being able to put in a, a, a gas-fired um, generator there, a small gas-fired generator there using the um, methane that's given off from the treatment plant. Um, obviously existing efficiency programs can be utilised. Um, and again, integrating that energy and transport infrastructure as well. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, so the more components of this vision that are built, um, the greater the benefits. Um, and you get really large improvements in reliability and resilience um, in many of these communities. I think at Malakuta, the mini grid we've installed there should, installed there should improve reliability by over 90%. And that means the Malakuta um, community can enjoy the same levels of reliability as if you are living in the middle of Melbourne. Um, so we're talking really large improvements in reliability from this technology. Um, you also get energy saving opportunities, um, community energy trading can be encouraged, um, get local job um, creation to, to maintain the assets. Um, and eventually, by removing the network connection um, completely, uh, you get material network savings. These, these long feeders are very, very expensive um, to maintain. Uh, if we move to the next, next slide. Um, so the practical outworking, um, the practical outworking of this vision is a, is a detailed design process on how to build out resilience in a community. And that's across two axes. The first axis is the time the system can survive with no network connection. Um, and obviously different combinations of assets can support you know, 60 minutes or two hours or five days, um, right through to a permanent islanding um, from the network. The other, access, the other axis is the scope of the resilience. So are we just protecting essential services or are we pro providing protection to a broader set of the community, the CBD? Um, the local businesses and residents, or is it all the way through to the entire community's residents and businesses um, that you're, you're providing this capability to? So the process we've de developed allows um, resilience to be built out in a modular fashion. Um, it's scalable depending on the funding and the characteristics of the community. It can be constructed in any order, taking advantage of existing community investments. And finally, it can be integrated with the other goals of the local communities around self-sufficiency and sustainability. Um, so this means meaningful discussions with communities and government on tailored and funded solutions rather than a one size fits all approach can be had. Um, so we've been working with the Malakuta community for the last two years. Um, and in conjunction with the Victorian government, we are looking to roll it out to other fire affected communities at Omeo and Koryong initially. Uh, if we move to the next slide, um, Malakuta is where we have um, the head start, where we have been trialling these technologies, um, and I think uh, is, the, is the demonstration that this can work um, and this can improve um, and solve permanently the resilience problem for some of these remote communities. So uh, after several months of trials, um, we commissioned a microgrid and diesel generator and battery storage um, in May of this year. 
And collectively, this gives um, the Mallacoota community five days of islanded capability. Um, from that point in time, you then need to be able to resupply the diesel generator to extend that. Um, the next phase has also been announced. So funded in conjunction with the Victorian government, um, we are going to give key essential businesses um, an additional five days of standalone capability. So that will be a 10, 10 days um, in combination. Um, and we're also gonna provide demand management capability across the community. Now this, this second um, capability is really important if you're going to have um, extended periods of islanded operation. Um, and, and we're talking here, the ability to balance load with demand. Um, as you're aware, a lot of the energy coming into the system is from renewable um, investments, solar panels, and you need to be able to shift load to be able to take advantage of that peak generation during the middle of the day. And that actually reduces the cost of the mini grid control that's required, the cost of the generation and storage um, um, capacity that needs to be installed as well. So there's um, a, a very big and important interaction between the different components of building out resilience. Um, so what's next? Um, for Osnet services, um, we, we are mapping out pathways to complete self-sufficiency um, for Malakuta. We're in the des detailed design phases for Omeo and Koryong. Um, we've also started design on additional bushfire affected communities in East Gippsland. Um, and we're pretty keen to do SAPS trials um, for isolated households um, along those long feeders. Um, if you are ever going to get rid of the feeders, it's not just the large towns that need their own supply. It is obviously all the farms and residences all along the line as well that need that, need that standalone um, capability. So that's just some insights into what we're doing on the ground and the vision of how we think we can make um, a much bigger impact right across um, our remote communities um, in our network. Um, I might leave you with um, the next slide, which I think raises some interesting questions uh, for this debate. Um, I think the open question for us is, and for us all, is are we actually accounting for the frequency and intensity of these natural disaster events correctly? Do we actually believe the forecasts um, that the climate change researchers are laying down for us? And are we actually acting like we believe? in those forecasts, even if we say we do um, believe them. And this, this slide I put up here is an illustration um, of that point. I've mapped out here um, the largest seven, they're all natural disaster events that have hit our network in the last 20 years. Um, seven very, very large events. Um, I'll just call out the one on the left, which was the recent storms, um, you know, and that goes to intensity. The, the, the storms in the Nanong Ranges was the largest event we have ever had in this network's history by a long, long way, as can be seen. Um, the, we actually lost more customer minutes off supply in that event than we have ever left uh, lost in an entire year before. So that goes to, are we really uh, grappling with the increased intensity of events um, as climate change hits, but also the frequency. I looked through the media on all of those events. The media described each of those seven events as a one in 100 year event. And yet there's seven of them in the last 20 years. So just an interesting open observation, I think, for the debate. But I'll uh, hand over to uh, Luke, I think now. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, welcome, everybody. I just wanted to... Um really focused today on essential energy's response to the bushfires and floods that we've had recently and um, specifically how we interacted with customers on the ground to support them through through these natural disasters and Nicola did a really good job of explaining um, some of the really confronting um, situations that customers have to deal with in events like these and um, at essential energy we put a real focus on trying to 
minimize the stress and anxiety of customers during these events. So I'm just gonna talk you through that. So I might just go to the next slide. Um, obviously the bushfires, if we just move on a bit more, the um, bushfires for essential energy caused unprecedented damage. We run the electricity network in New South Wales, regional and rural New South Wales. We cover about 95% of the state. Um, to the point Tom made about size of these events getting bigger, we had about 3,200 poles destroyed during the um, black summer bushfires. And the previous biggest event that we'd ever dealt with was 400 poles um, destroyed. So this just goes to show that the size of the event. Um, at the peak of our response, we had a third of our workforce from across the whole state and a third of our heavy fleet converged on the south coast of New South Wales to, to rebuild the network down there. But why we were rebuilding that network, um, we were really minded to how could we support those communities and, and reduce their anxiety. Um, so we put in place a, a customer support package very early on in the response. Um, and some of the things we did there, um, we obviously paused all disconnections for non-payment. Um, customers had um, concerns about private assets and how to, how to rebuild those. And rather than them having to do that at their own cost, we came in and rebuilt th those assets at our own cost. Um, we worked very closely with emergency operations centres, councils, community organisations. And what we did is we had staff embedded 24 seven in the local emergency operations centres, which really um, kept us very connected to the communities and meant that we were able to deploy our resources where, where the community needed them first, um, not necessarily where we might have thought um, that those resources needed to be deployed. Um, like Osnet, we had customers that were out for long periods of time. Um, some customers were out of supply for up to eight weeks. Uh, and that was due to those issues that Nicola mentioned about not even being able to get onto the fire grounds. And in some cases, um, councils had to rebuild bridges and significant infrastructure before we could even get into the area to rebuild. So we actually delivered <clears throat> generators to individuals that were without supply for extended period of time. Uh, we supplied um, those customers with uh, fuel if there was no fuel stations available, or we supplied them with um, fuel cards um, for those generators and where customers had their own generators, we, we provided them with fuel cards so that they didn't have to bear the burden of the cost of the fuel uh, whilst, whilst the network was being rebuilt. Um, we made calls to over 5,000 registered life support customers to check on their welfare. And in fact, we had our asset inspectors going door to door, knocking, talking to community members and making sure that their welfare was was okay and seeing what extra assistance we could provide them. We also installed nine standalone power systems to bushfire affected customers. And this was critical to our response because it meant that we could focus our efforts in terms of rebuilding the network on those areas where we could get the most customers back on quickly, but it didn't at the same time disadvantage those customers who are at the fringe of the grid who we were able to supply with standalone power system. And we have begun installing composite poles um, in lieu of timber poles because our experience during the fires was that the composite poles um, simply, simply don't burn. Um, they survive the fire and, um, and makes the restoration a lot easier than if the poles have been, been destroyed. We might just move on to the, the floods. So uh, in March this year, the north coast of New South Wales was impacted by, by a one in 200 year flood. Um, it broke the previous records uh, by several, several metres. So it was quite a devastating event for the community. And we learnt um, from the bushfires that again, we needed to get this customer support package uh, in place very quickly. So if we just move to the next slide, um, Again, we did a lot of those things around waiving reconnection fees and pausing disconnections for non-payment, repairing private assets and providing generators. One thing that we did in this response, which uh, was slightly different to the bushfires and I guess was a, was a learning and, it, and it's talked to in Nicola's report where community members and community groups were using social media 
and particularly Facebook um, to, 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 I guess, voice their concerns about what their needs were. We had people that monitored those social media sites and we stepped in rather than letting the community having to, to work out how they could um, support themselves. So a good example um, was a local um, business in Port Macquarie um, that put a call out for fuel to supply dairy farms that were disconnected and they were, they were ferrying the fuel via, a, um, via an oyster barge to, to disconnected and remote dairy farms. Um, we provided the fuel and the jerry cans to those community groups so that they could um, they could provide that fuel to the to customers, and we also um, set up our our fleet team with um, with jerry cans and fuel, and we we personally distributed that to to our customers, and we were able to use that opportunity to explain to them how long the power would be out for and if they needed any other assistance, um, including things like setting up um, mobile phone charging hubs, which Nicola also mentioned. Um, one thing that also I noticed that was mentioned in, in Nicola's report, which really resonated with me, is we had an area of Port Macquarie, which is called the North Shore, which was totally isolated by floodwaters. Um, and um, we were able to to re-establish uh, re the, the high voltage supply very quickly, um, but the area was still was still isolated and, every, and many, many of the houses had gone underwater, so therefore needed their switchboards um, and the, the wiring inside the house checked. There was no way that, um, there was no way that electricians could get across there. Um, so customers would have been in, in quite a disadvantaged position. And as many of you would know, it's the, it, it ultimately is the homeowner's responsibility to check and, and get that wiring um, made safe in their house. So what we did is essential energy, we tapped into our own contractor panel and we, we organized electricians um, to be ferried over by boat um, to that community and um, we organised community consultation forums where we explained the process. The electricians were then able to work directly for the customer um, to restore their supply and work with their insurance companies. But it took away the anxiety of the customer of how they would possibly go about organising an electrician when they're you know, virtually on an island um, that no one can get to. Um, so we found that to be quite a, quite a useful um, quite a useful way of supporting our customers through this event. I think at that point, uh, I hand back to you for a panel discussion. I think we're just getting organized, everybody on the screen. Kerry, you're gonna leave the slides up or you're gonna, there, thanks, great. So thanks everybody and many of you uh, know me, some of you may not if I haven't met you. I'm Lynn Gallagher, I'm the CEO of Energy Consumers Australia. Um, thanks for the questions that have um, already been posted in the Q&A and some of the comments in chat. Some of them are specific and if we don't get to them, um, what we did last time in our previous webinar was pose those questions to the organisations and invite their replies and then we can um, share them with you. So if I don't get to them today, it doesn't mean I don't think they're important. Um, but we we will get you some we'll get you some responses. So what I wanted to just kick off, um, you know, we've heard um, from Nicola on the on the report and and really the voices and and feelings and views of the communities about what these kinds of events and the recovery means to them. Um, some great work um, by two of the networks. Um, in this context, I guess what we're really wanting to start is a national dialogue about resilience. It's not just a community that's experienced a great crisis and a great tragedy. But I'd like to go to the provocation, I think, that Tom threw out, which is with more severe and more frequent um, extreme weather events, which mean loss of power to communities. Um, I guess I'd like to get the panelists to sort of um, give us some sort of views on what are the, what are the real challenges and the opportunities in actually um, taking the action that, that Tom was talking about, given that that's gonna be the new normal. So do you want to start with you, Tom, maybe seeing you throughout the question? I'm going to throw it back onto you, but 
please Luke and Nicola jump in um, once Tom's had a, had a go. Uh, thanks, Lynn. Um, look, there are there are still um, challenges. Um, I'd, I'd sort of break them up into different um, categories. First, firstly, there's there's technical challenges, um, and uh, you know, balancing balancing an islanded grid um, with a lot of renewable energy energy coming into it for example, is, is very technically challenging. Um, and that is one of the things we found at Malakuta. We, we were trialling technology um, for a good um, eight months before we, before we finally commissioned the batteries. And indeed, we see a lot of feedback in Nicola's work saying, oh, the batteries have been there for ages, but I haven't seen any ch <laughs> change to our reliability yet. Um, and, and that amount of time is required to actually make all these components work effectively together. But one of the challenges we didn't expect um, was uh, peak renewable generation in the middle of the day um, was actually overwhelming our ability to store it in an islanded, in, in, in an islanded state. So that required some rejigging, um, uh, rejigging of the whole protection and control systems. Um, so, th so there's technical challenges and each community will be different. Um, so the, you know, it's, it's not um, something you can just simply roll out as a one size fits all approach. Um, the other challenge we have, and again, Nicholas um, highlighted this really well, is each community is different and your relationships in each community is different and what they want um, it, it is, is different. So you need to find um, local partners that you can work with. Um, and that's been really challenging during COVID, really challenging during COVID for our organisation. And, and again, it's come through starkly, I think, in Nicholas' research that um, people noticed our response during the event, but there's question marks of have you gone missing from the conversations about long-term recovery um, and uh, that's real we 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 have um, absolutely had great amounts uh, great difficulty doing the sort of engagement we wanted to do and plan to do um, due to the COVID um, pandemic and and you, and you can see that strong link into continuing the, the, the strong link to needing to continue the, that conversation um, um, after these events and, and being seen and being present and building long-term um, relationships. Uh, so we're, we're getting better at it, but um, we are far, far from perfect. Um, so, so that's absolutely crucial. The other, the other challenge um, I think is, is cultural um, for an organisation. You need to um, get that feedback loop you need to be going out and being curious and asking questions and doing research that gives you actionable, um, actionable um, things you can do in response. It's not a, how does the community feel, what does the community want us to do is what you need to find out. And, and can you do it? And if you can't do it, you need to be in the conversation and tell them why. Um, and I guess the last one I'll just finish is, is an obvious one um, where we're, we're doing a lot of this under trials or with government funding. A lot of it doesn't um, stand alone um, or stand up to a simple cost, traditional cost benefit analysis. And so there's, there's two things to that, you need multiple funding streams um, and, and the Victorian government, I think, is very much involved in these conversations and is very active in these conversations putting money um, where their mouth is, um, as, as indeed the business is. Um, but look, I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll, I'll give Luke a chance. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, look, I think from, from our perspective, it's, you know, Tom really covered it. It's about engaging with those communities at the grassroots to understand exactly uh, what they need and when they need it. Um, and um, we didn't have quite the same challenges that, that Tom did in terms of in, in our communities getting their, their buy-in and involvement. Um, 
but we did find that, that if you can seek out those very influential members of the community and and sh help them become an advocate for you, um, then um, we found that that really helped improve the ability to to restore supply um, in the traditional sense. And so, um, you know, I've, I personally spent a lot of time on the fire grounds. I personally delivered diesel fuel to dairy farmers and other community groups during the, the flood crisis. And it was a real opportunity to, to kind of understand what those communities wanted and needed and, and then to be able to react to it. And, um, you know, I guess, but let your actions speak for you um, on the ground. That's what we found really worked. So um, now there is a cultural change, culture change required in the organization as Tom mentioned. So, um, I think at the start of the bushfires that the, probably we had a culture that was like, well, our job is to, to rebuild the network. So um, should we be distracted by, and, and this is sort of people on the ground, should we be distracted by doing fuel drops and other things like that? Um, but once you start to introduce those things and the team members on the ground see how that helps them in terms of relieving a bit of the pressure in terms of the community's expectations um, and the community really feeling valued by the energy provider, um, everyone starts to, to really appreciate how much that helps. Um, and then by the end of it, you start to get to the point, which is what happened in the floods, where it's actually the, the organisation has a kind of a self-healing culture where it's, it's people on the ground coming up with the ideas and saying, hey, why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? Can we supply fuel? Can we drop off water, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the organisations, unfortunately, have had a good opportunity to build up a lot of muscle memory through these events. Um, and um, that is, I think, proving very beneficial to the end customer. I think that's really interesting hearing this sort of um, way in which you've responded at that very local level, because I think sometimes um, we forget that some of the people that are not necessarily in our hierarchies are the closest to the actual problem that we're trying to solve. And um, that seems to have been one of the things that, you know, certainly in some of the work I've done in the water sector is also very critical in being able to respond quickly. It's not necessarily a conversation had from head office and how we trust our people on the ground how we um, actually encourage them to become that community connection where it's not normally the way we think about it. You know, there's a whole division that's about community engagement or we've got a CRM system and we'll just send them a text. So I think that's a really challenging thing for, for businesses. Um, I think one of the things that I'd be really mindful of is what is the problem we're trying to solve? It sounds really simple, um, but we often lose sight of it. And your, um, your, the challenge, Luke, you said you had in terms of, you know, oh, gosh, you know, is our job to rebuild the wires and poles or should we actually be delivering fuel? It's interesting, that whole conversation about fuel, because when you talk about, um, you know, OK, we're all going to get... Um, uh, what's that? generators. I'm, I live in the Dandenong Ranges, so I've just experienced this whole thing myself. But the generators also have their own problem because then fuel insecurity becomes the issue. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's that sort of what problem we're trying to solve. And it's actually how do we get them something that they can actually start to live a normal life as quickly as possible is very different to our job is to rebuild infrastructure because our job is about wires and poles. Yeah, so we, we, we sort of that was the sort of epiphany that we had, Nicola, was that our job is to provide energy. So we actually put essential energy stickers on the jerry cans and the generators that mm -hmm. we gave out, which kind of might seem a bit odd. But the point was, um, we're providing you with an alternative energy source whilst we work on rebuilding the, the traditional energy source. Um, and your point about um, supporting those on the ground, we have a concept of at essential energy, which we call turning the pyramid upside down, which means... Mm -hmm that the most important person um, in the response is actually the, the line worker or the electrical technician or the customer relationship manager. It's those people on the front line. And, and my job as a executive is to support them to do their best work. So, um, you know, some people say, well, why is the executive out there delivering fuel? It's like, well, today that's the best way that I can support my team and take some pressure off them. So, 
Um, that was certainly the way that we've approached these things. Um, and we do at Essential Energy provide, um, or sorry, have a lot of control at the local level. So we don't have, um, we don't have executives and senior leaders in a, in a control room somewhere deciding where the power should be restored first. We, we leave those decisions to, to local managers and local depot leaders who know their communities the best. Um, uh, of course, we, we work on restoring the backbone and those sort of things in, in the background. But in terms of at that very local level, we, we empower those on the ground to actually make those decisions. Um, okay. I'd just like to say ditto to what Luke's, Luke's saying. Uh, the thing I'd add, and this is the concept of being the service provider in the community, is regardless of how that supply is, is provided, whether it's with a network or with uh, a standalone mini grid, um, the community is looking for a complete service package from their local distribution company. They yeah. want it to be seamless. The complexities you're talking about and dealing with generators and so forth or SAP systems, they want the same support they have from their network for a standalone solution as well. And that, that's, that's what we're hearing very, very strongly out in the ground. Okay. That, that was actually one of the things that people said they were concerned about. They'd become responsible for something that was really complex. And if you think about the complexity of just the solar panels and, um, you know, the rebates and the feed-ins and all of that stuff, you know, to sort of say to small communities, right, we're going to give you a standalone system and you're going to be responsible. It's scary stuff. So it is a very long-term dialogue. And I think that's what you found also, wasn't it, Tom, with working with Malakuta, that, you know, not just the eight months of the trial, but the, the sort of years of working with that community around what's the solution and what will work best and how do we, how do, we do it. Yep. And, and recognising you're only talking to parts of the community. I thought that was another great point you made, is that, you know, we've been talking for two years and yet you, you've had plenty of feedback um, from Malakuta residents saying, we don't know anything about a battery or I'm not aware, why isn't it working and, and so forth. And so you've got always got to be aware that you uh, communicate more and more and more. Yep. <laughs> it's a great conversation. I'm going to try and um, pick up, I guess, almost an amalgam of a couple of points that are coming out in the Q&A. So I think these have been great reflections and insights about uh, you know, communities that experience crisis. I guess there's a couple of things that have come up in the Q&A uh, which really go to the big picture, like what, what a bigger picture, it's not the big picture, a bigger picture, which is also how is this sort of experience of more frequent, more severe weather events becoming the new normal, but how is that impacting how the networks think more about delivering services more broadly. Um, you know, I often hear from individual networks as well, you know, it's not, it's not just Malakuta or if I think of, I might generalise to TAS networks, you know, there's 27 communities there that one of them or two of them might have had floods or bushfires, but there's 27 of them that have ongoing challenges in terms of outages, reliability. So I guess it's how to draw the link or build the bridge between what you've learnt in these extreme weather events and outages to outages more generally, I guess, or reliability and security more generally. And while I've got the floor, I'll just add another couple of things that have come through as well, because it, it is a sort of sense of, well, then how are the costs shared as well? So, um, you know, what might be... Can we, can we do a bespoke solution for one community, but does every community get the same opportunity or are the costs somehow managed? And I think, Tom, you went to some of this may go beyond network funding. And then the other question as well, which goes to costs, I'm sorry to do this in a three-part way, but I really like the fact that each of you are sort of, you know, having a conversation. So I don't want to sort of keep peppering you with questions and make you answer a sort of single view. But um, the other thing is really then uh, to the extent that networks are thinking more broadly about resilience and across services more broadly, uh, is there a need for integrating that into the sort of planning and frankly, the, you know, the funding 
the approved revenue of networks to actually explicitly think about these kinds of climate risks. Um, again, we're in a new normal. So do we treat these as outliers and aberrations or do we somehow now take all of these lessons into this is the new normal for how networks really should plan uh, and deliver services? So I'll stop there. Maybe why don't we start with Luke this time and feel free, Nicola and Tom, just to jump in. So I'll leave a couple of points. I'll answer probably not in order, but in terms of the the cost side of it, um, in the absence of any additional revenue that Tom discussed that may or may not be available from government, um, obviously the costs of the way the regulatory set up is that costs are ultimately borne by customers. We've done extensive research as part of our regulatory submission and asked our own customers, um, are you okay to pay a little bit more um, for customers that are in parts of the network that have poor reliability to improve their reliability? And, and the overwhelming answer has been yes. Um, so there is a good sort of social foundation within the customer base that says, um, you know, we're okay in, in Port Macquarie where we've got very, very good reliability and a very strong network. To pay to pay a bit more for customers in Tipper Bar to get their to get their um to get their reliability improved, um, but of course you know like all networks we you know constantly looking for applying for federal government funding or whatever it is to to minimise that cost to our customers. Um, but and sorry, in terms of the question about thinking about how we design and build the network moving forward. Um, this concept of building back better was simply not just replacing the network as it was. You might, as Tom mentioned, you might have to do that in the immediate aftermath of the bushfire because it's the quickest way to get the, the power restored. But um, at Essential Energy, we're investing heavily in composite poles. So we've, we've um, so it's fi effectively fiberglass poles um, that, as I said, don't, you know, experience don't burn. And we've been using composite cross arms for about 12 years now. So um, that's a huge ramp up that we're undertaking at the moment. Um, and also certain parts of the network we have rebuilt using underground technology. Um, and also, as you can appreciate a network is because ours, some of the assets were built for legacy reasons, especially around the snowy mountains. They were never built. They were never actually designed as such as a network. They were built to support the construction of the snowy mountain scheme and then effectively remained in place for, for, 60 or 70 years what we've done in that case is once the fire's gone through and destroyed it we've actually taken a clean sheet approach and redesigned and built the network in a different in a different way that might have different feeds from different directions that are less prone to bushfires um, you need to buy yourself some breathing space to do that and we did that through um, generation and standalone power systems to give us some time to to think about the best way to rebuild the network um, so certainly yeah, you can't just put it back the way it was and expect a different result. Um, yeah. That would be the definition of madness, I suppose. I think, I think, Lynn, the effects of climate change are changing the cost-benefit analysis and it will continue to change it. Um, and that is being incorporated into BAU planning. It is absolutely a fundamental part of BAU planning. So this is much broader than um, simply natural disasters and resilience. Um, it's about cost, about the long-term costs and, and, and risks of the network in, in various areas. Um, so we're, we work with a lot of other communities outside of Gippsland on exactly the same issues, but the drivers may be a bit, bit different. I think Phillip Island is a great example, been working with that community for a long period of time. Um, we are now looking at battery solutions um, as part of standard planning um, for Phillip Island's power needs um, and... and um, uh, we are very confident there'll be battery solutions built in that area. And that is justified purely on standard planning. It doesn't rely, doesn't require cross subsidy at all. So um, absolutely it, it needs to be and is part of BAU. Um, parts of our network uh, through climate change are becoming ridiculously um, expensive, not just from a maintenance point of view, but a risk point of view, bushfire risk and so forth point of view. Um, so again, we are we're putting in place long-term plans to remove um, the network um, 
from areas or at least have the capability to do it. So again, Malakuta is a great example. It's on the longest feeder on our network. We, we've got plans for Malakuta, but we also have um, we also have detailed plans with regards to how we can gradually um, remove that long feeder um, all the way back to Can River. Um, now the cost benefit doesn't stack up right now, but you know, as we constantly looking at the costs coming down, storage costs are the absolute killer here um, and, and a huge driver, I think, of, of um, what can be rolled out cost, cost effectively. Um, so it, it is absolutely part of BAU and, you know, networks don't want incredibly expensive uh, and dangerous parts of their network to remain in place if they, could, if they can use these other technologies. We, we actually have the incentives to get rid of the network in those, in those cases. I think that's um, a really interesting point around the sort of risk framework, because I think as, um, you know, as things around our capacity to actually keep our employees safe during the crisis while we're trying to re recover services, and I know from the experience I had here in the Dandenong Ranges, it wasn't safe. You couldn't get up here, even if you wanted to. Um, so, you know, there's sort of a lot of things that probably need to be considered at a board level that are slightly different to the way in which we might think about things normally in terms of you know the risk framework but also um one of the things that you know there's two things that strike me the demographics of regional areas is going to be changing is changing enormously um it's difficult to see yet just what the longer term implications might be but it certainly does seem like many more people are deciding well actually we can leave the, the cities and and you know hike off to somewhere else and work remotely so the sort of cost benefit analysis might start to change in some areas as you actually find that the population increases. The other thing that I think is really um, important that we think about is at the moment we're so much about one service provider, you know, what's happening with energy. But actually the water, the telco, they're all dealing with exactly the same person at the end of their service who needs somebody to actually say, this is how it's all going to work. Um, and we don't do resilience training or planning within organisations based on who else is going to come in at that point and work together. And even across water, the water sector, we don't really think what will, how will we operate as a collection of water authorities to service the needs of East Gippsland. We still have to have our individual plans. And I think there's much more we could do by thinking about how can we actually triangulate with the other people that are going to be there thinking about that same person, that same household, that same community, so that we're really capitalising on the commonalities. Yeah, I think the electricity networks do a pretty pretty good job of that in terms of we all have MOUs to provide resources to other networks during these these large events we supplied generators to Ausgrid. we they supplied large generators to us we supplied contractors to help tom out during the east gippsland sorry during the um dandenong storm so um the networks have been doing electricity networks have been doing that for quite some time but but we also run a water utility nicholas i can appreciate what you're saying i think in water it's a it's a different kettle of fish yeah. and and look we lost um water up here as well so i guess that's the, the mm. other thing you know this is a so we're part of melbourne metropolitan area the power went out we actually could not even have a it wasn't a boiled water alert they actually had to bring in water um for some of the communities up here so the whole thing it's like that it's a domino effect across our services isn't it and at the end of that is one person, one community, one household sitting there saying, how are they going to fix this for me? Absolutely. I think that's one of the scariest things that have come out of the bushfires and, and the ban on storms is how reliant the individual pieces of infrastructure are on each other. Um, the water, In particular, fresh water coming out of your taps is, is very reliant on power. Um, but the, the thing that really, um, I think, surprised us and maybe it shouldn't um, have is, is the loss of the comms networks. Mm -hmm. uh, they do have standalone power supplies, but again, are we, are we calculating the risks properly? Um, comms networks going down, um, 
swathes of Melbourne during those storms not having access to triple O um, for an extended period of time. Um, like I said, this conversation is so important because, because things, are, things are changing and they're changing quickly and demonstrably through to climate change. I want to pick up another theme um, before we, you know, start to run out of time. Um, one of the themes that's come through, I guess I've heard from each of you, is absolutely the critical importance of, uh, I guess, both prepare for preparedness and recovery is having, and, and certainly in a crisis, but on, throughout, I guess, the whole cycle, is the need for local partners or the community as a partner. And I guess I wanted to sort of throw to Nicola and then get some thoughts from you, Luke and Tom. Um, it, it, Nicola talked about, Nicola, you talked about how the Australian Electoral Commission pay, played an important role in Mallacoota. But I guess, again, it's a real challenge, isn't it, for how to resource and bring together, um, you know, a community to be able to act as a partner, to be able to take on board the interests of the communities. And there's competing views. And, you know, one of the comments that's called, one of the questions has come up about, you know, what do people feel most strongly about, about technological solutions? And as you said, there's quite a diversity of views. So I think one of the sort of uh, something we've got to think more about um, is about how we are creating those community partners. I think that's a really good point. And I guess I thought the thing about Malakuta was we used an existing framework we have to give people a role in their own self-determination. And everybody could say, oh, we understand this system that they're putting in place. We're familiar with it. It's how we vote for our council and all those things. But as you say, it's not right for all communities. And I think, um, you know, Tom or Luke earlier, maybe both said, you know, they often find that there's a few people in the community that they work with in partnership that, that are and often they're in the, you know, the, the people that are in the community centres doing the great work. They're, you know, they're the heart and, and, and soul of their communities and they take on those other responsibilities. But that also has a challenge because these are the people that are actually really connected and they want the community to be strong and do better. They're not technical people. So I did notice one of the questions was about what was the kind of tech, um, did they have a, 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 an idea on what kind of technology solution they wanted? No, they don't. Mm. It's a, and that is why it's such a, a really complicated conversation to have and has to be had well before the heat of the moment because there's lots of trade-offs, there's cost increases, there's reliability, there's, you know, what does it mean in a crisis? How can we respond quickly or not? Um, so I, I guess I just think that's why that community engagement is so important and trying to sort of really bring them along for the for the the journey because it really is a, a journey to find what's the right solution for, for that group of people. But I guess my point about the Electoral Commission was that we need to think of what those things are that we can wrap around our communities so that it doesn't become the a, it's a coin a phrase, a he said, she said type arrangement where, you know, you're just ending up in a, a conflict when there's really a high stress. So people are going to be fractious and, you know, argumentative or difficult, um, probably more so than their normal selves. Um, and I think the more that we can do that and have those conversations early when they're not in a state of heightened stress um, would be my, my thought there. Tom? Luke, lessons about communities and supporting consumer engagement. It's it's one of the things, you know, that's often said, and I'm not going to sort of ping anybody, but it's often said, you know, again, you've talked about a lot of the visibility. I guess it's this longer-term yep. complex consumer engagement that's really the challenge for not only for electricity networks, I'm sure it's equally true of water utilities or everybody else, but you've got to be there for the long haul and the community's got to see there. But there's also uh, some way in which there's got to be some sort of glue, which, you know, brings a bunch of people together. And I wonder how, you know, networks feel they can, in your case, you know, each of you perhaps feels how you can support that. Um, that long-term partner is is absolutely 
crucial because the conversations you need to be having are over years and decades. They're not they're not over days and weeks. Um, and what we've experienced in the last two natural disasters is um, I'll actually give some big wraps out to the to the councils and the the capability that sits in the local in local government it might actually surprise some people. Um, and 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 this goes to not creating needless duplication of existing community structures. It's actually find out what they are, find out what is effective in those communities, and then um, piggyback or or um, input your expertise into existing structures um, and existing conversations that are going on. Um, don't don't try and build something outside outside of that. It, for a start, it, it would be you know a, a huge waste of resources. But there really is that existing expertise. So for the bushfires and, and the Dandenong storms in particular, um, we we were basically um, multiplying the effect of the existing local council um, responses, and we had good relationships. We knew who to talk to in those councils, so that's that's where we have to do the hard work. Um, knowing who in a council you need to speak to. Um, we know in our areas that we get um, frustrations from councils with them knowing who to talk to in Osnet services. Um, and that is an ongoing project, yep. <laughs> an ongoing project. Um, but uh, it, it actually worked incredibly well during the, the, the Dandenong storms. And then it's utilising those, contact, those contacts that you make in the heat of battle, as I said before, then don't, hang up the phone and don't talk to them till the next natural disaster. You have to be, you have to be talking to these people continually and then they know more about their communities. Who should you be talking to in their communities? They can get the community to come along and have a conversation. Um, okay. In New South Wales, we established, like the government established um, bushfire recovery committees after the bushfires. So we were part of those and they went for sometimes... 12 to 18 months after the after the fire, some of them are still going, and that was to have a holistic view of how you support the community after after the after the immediate event. And whilst you might go, some people might say, well, once you've got the power back onto everyone, is that your job done? Well, the answer clearly is no, because A, there's some of those resilience things we spoke about and how we can do better and interface better with communications authorities and those things. But even simple things like um, providing condemned poles, the good part of the condemned poles to farmers so they could use them to create um, fences, for example, was a good example of, of one of the things we did um, uh, and, and helping, um, helping organisations like Blaze Aid to rebuild fences. Um, addressing community concerns about there's a burnt pole in my paddock and the cow licked it, is the cow going to die because of the arsenic that was in the CCA pole? Like all those sort of issues that go on for three, six, 12 months after the fire to, to Tom or the flood or whatever it is, to Tom's point, um, you need to have that ongoing dialogue and be part of that discussion. So I'm going to just make one last point. We've got a few more minutes and then we're going to wrap up. I guess what I'm hearing just in that response as well is showing up is really important and showing up and staying part of the community is really important to continue to some build and cement trust. So maybe one last comment from each of you, maybe start with you, Nicola, and others then jump in about what's the one thing you think that is important to, to building trust between communities and, and the industry? Oh, I think one of the things is to have an open mind. Um, we often stand in our corners and we sort of, you know, when things start to go wrong between an organisation, like, a, you know, an energy provider and a customer or a community, it, we retreat to our corners and sort of go, actually, um, they don't understand me. And the business says, no, they don't understand how complex it is. So at the, it, the, that's not helpful for anybody. And, and recognising that it's at, there's probably more commonalities than there are differences and finding those things to start to sort of build that relationship of trust is, I think, you know, a better way to start than many. That's great. Tom? I, I'd just add visibility. You, you have to be there. You have to be seen. 
Um, I think one of the proudest moments for our organisation during the current storms is when the 7.30 report, you know, interviewed a whole bunch of community members that were quite traumatised um, by the events up there. Um, they said they felt, they felt abandoned and the only two organisations they saw was the emergency services and Osnet services. And that's what, that's what we aspire <laughs> to be, um, that we are seen in these times of need. That's great. Luke, last word from you. Yeah, so, I mean, building on Tom's point, like Osnet, we're the second people on the ground after the rural fire service. That's, that's sort of the way we operate. But um, what I would say is, you know, we're blessed to lead very large, well-resourced, capable organisations. And we can do so much more than just rebuild the electricity network. So just, you know, using those resources for, for kind of good on the ground, regardless of, of, what, it is, of what the community needs, um, you know, we just shouldn't pigeonhole, pigeonhole ourselves into we only put poles and wires back in the ground. Um, it could be, you know, the example that was used of cleaning windows or whatever it is for the community. If we've got resources available, um, we sort of go all in and support the community as much as we can. Hey, that's great. Look, I feel like we could have um, even gone longer with this um, conversation, but I know uh, Zoom can be really exhausting um, for people. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of, of, of the dialogue um, here today and the participation from people um, attending as well, raising some questions. Um, we hope that this has been uh, the start of a, a conversation uh, that's going to be ongoing in different places in different ways. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, our panellists. Thank you, Nicola, for the, for the great work, for the, the great research. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Luke and Tom and Tom's uh, colleague, Stephanie Judd, has been on standby there in the background in case there was... Uh, something that Stephanie might have needed to contribute, but I'd really like to thank them for the spirit in which they've also participated in this discussion. And, you know, it takes a bit of vulnerability from, from all of us, from organisations to be willing to, to be open in these conversations, as, as Nicola just uh, said in her last comments about keeping open minds uh, and building trust and creating the opportunities for communities um, to take the lead uh, in what they need and in and and that's going to be so critical uh, to resilience and and recovery um, last thing I need to say is uh, we have one more uh, webinar in uh, in our series which is on system design and that's on September the 7th where again we'll be taking uh, a, a big picture view I guess of how, uh, the energy system meets consumer needs uh, in the future in the face of things like climate risk. Um, also, uh, we have plans for our foresighting forum in 2022. Uh, the dates are there, obviously subject to the ever-changing uncertain environment we're in. It will either be online or it would be nice to think that in February 2022, and I don't know why it says February 21, but that's all right, February 22, it'd be nice to think that it could be uh, a, a sort of return to normal. I guess it won't be a fully return to normal, but we'll hope we can make it as, uh, as normal as possible. Um, we also like to finish with a provocation of our own, thanks to a number of people who've already posted the great work that um, a number of organisations are doing in this space. I won't call you out because I'd be embarrassed if I missed some of the um, organisations that have told us uh, the, the work they're doing, but I just want to thank you um, for the role all of your organisations are playing uh, in, in delivering uh, for consumers uh, as Nicola's often said to me, you know, what we're learning out of all of this, which should be obvious, but really how important and how critical power is in our lives, to our well-being, to our health, to our sense of community, to our sense of security and normality. Um, so thank you to the, all, all the organisations either on this um, webinar or who not here today, but I want to thank them on behalf of consumers for the roles they're all playing. Um, 
and uh, continue to uh, contribute to the dialogue. So thanks very much. I'd just also like to say thank you to my team who as always do an amazing job in making these things work. So thanks very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye.